on the order paper is a motion on the extension of the European Union withdrawal transition period. I will ask the clerk to read the motion. That this Assembly notes its unique role as a named party to the UK-EU withdrawal agreement and the unique impact of Brexit on Northern Ireland. Further notes the ongoing COVID-19 crisis and the extreme challenges facing businesses and workers and calls on the UK Government to request and the European Union to agree an extension to the current Brexit transition period beyond 31st of December 2020 in order that businesses have adequate time to prepare and for the implementation of new arrangements. Thank you. I call Mr Matthew O'Toole to move the motion. So moved, Mr President, Speak. Thank you. The Business Committee has agreed to allow up to one hour and 30 minutes for this debate. The proposer of this motion will have 10 minutes to propose and 10 minutes to wind. One amendment has been selected and is published in the Marshall List. I ask Mr O'Toole to please open the debate on the motion. Thank you, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. For the past four years, Northern Ireland has been at the centre of an enormous diplomatic and political dilemma. The UK's exit from the European Union was always going to profoundly and uniquely affect our region. The EU is an organisation whose aim is peace building, but whose means are deepened economic integration and legal obligation across member states. Those are technocratic terms. But what it amounted to was breaking down borders and creating connection between people and places. Nowhere is that sense of connection more important than in Northern Ireland. We are a place defined not just by division, but by being connected to two jurisdictions, and indeed two nations, being in two places at once, on the island of Ireland, but not in the Irish state, in the British state, but not on the island of Britain. Our society is shaped by these complexities and contradictions, as is this institution, which is specifically designed to accommodate our uniquely complex society. Managing that complexity was always going to be an enormous challenge during the Brexit process. And so, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, it proved. But despite being at the centre of that debate, we were also absent from it. For the vast majority of the past four years, the Northern Ireland Assembly has, been sitting, has not been sitting to scrutinise or debate what was happening in the Brexit process, even when it so obviously affected the lives and livelihoods of all the people we represent. And there was no Northern Ireland executive to make representations on behalf of people here, even when our future was the most talked about issue in European politics. And if anyone is in any doubt that a functioning executive and assembly might have made a difference, they should look to one of the most rational and balanced documents produced in Northern Ireland on Brexit. It was a letter dated 10th of August 2016 and co-signed by the then First Ministers Arlene Foster and Martin McGuinness. Despite the subsequent differences that arose in our parties, this document set out a clear set of asks from the UK Government, most notably that, and I quote, the Northern Ireland Executive be fully involved and represented in the negotiations. Mr Deputy, Principal Deputy Speaker, suffice to say, we were not. Our institution's absence from the stage could hardly have been timed worse. This Assembly collapsed in January 2017. That was just two months before Article 50 was triggered. We did not return here until after the UK Parliament had ratified the withdrawal agreement and barely three weeks before the UK would leave the European Union. Not only were we not at the races, we gave our wallet to a gambler to spend as they pleased. Well, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, we are here now, better late than never. And that brings me to the substance of today's motion. We are now too late to stop Brexit. The UK, including Northern Ireland, has left the European Union. I bitterly regret that this is the case, and I hope that in the future, before I get too old, we will have the opportunity to rejoin it. We did, after all, vote to remain. But let me be absolutely clear, that is not what today is about. This isn't about rerunning the debates of the referendum or the subsequent three years. This is about where we are now. And where we are now is in the midst of not just the greatest global health emergency in our lifetimes, but entering into what could be the deepest recession in recorded history. The Congressional Budget Office in the United States estimated yesterday that COVID-19 could cost the UK economy, the US economy, I should say, eight trillion dollars, that's trillion, over the next decade. To put that in context, the total size of the UK economy in 2019 was around three trillion dollars. Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, there are no precedents for what is about to happen to our economy and our society. 
Currently, the UK, like most developed economies, including the Republic of Ireland, is paying to deep freeze a large section of its economy its, and its workforce in the expectation that economic activity can be safely restarted over the coming weeks and months. The executive, as with governments all over the world, are undertaking similar experiments, and that is what they are, experiments. No one knows how much demand now remains for services and goods that have been shut down for months. No one knows whether entire sectors of our economy will even be able to operate within social distancing guidelines. No one knows what proportion of the workforce will be in self-isolation at any one time, having been in contact with a positive case. Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, these are all unknowns. Unknowns that are common to every country battling COVID-19 and seeking to deal with the profound economic consequences. But only one country is holding open the possibility of rupturing its biggest trading relationship in the middle of this crisis. The UK government currently insists that it will not extend the Brexit transition period beyond the end of this year. And let us be clear what the transition period is. It isn't EU membership. It is a holding position that maintains the practical economic benefits of membership until a new relationship can be agreed. The UK's chief negotiator, David Frost, as well as multiple senior ministers, in particular Michael Gove, have insisted that it would be unthinkable to extend the transition period and that the UK should exit that transition on 31st December this year, whether there is a new UK-EU trade deal or not. Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, that is mad. It's a bit like driving 30 miles to test your eyesight. It's mad and it's dangerous. It's especially dangerous because we know how close we came in recent weeks to serious disruption to supply chains across these islands. If we end this year with no trade deal and no extension to the transition, we could face the very real prospect of significant disruption to supply chains, not just from Calais to Dover, but from Holyhead to Dublin, a route which is critical to the Northern Ireland market, and also at Belfast and Larne. And as I and my colleagues have raised repeatedly, it could prevent us from doing essential cross-border contact tracing because we will need an, a UK-EU data equivalence regime to share information in real time on people who are crossing, for example, back and forth between Derry and Donegal. Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, I have not yet dwell, dwelt on the detail of the Ireland Protocol. The Protocol, in my view, offers vital protections to Northern Ireland, but real commitments, including financial commitments, need to be made by the UK Government to enable the Executive and other parties to implement the Protocol in a way that works for businesses and workers here. And the best way to make a, bur to, to make a burden of that Protocol is for the UK to crash out of the transition period without businesses being given adequate time to make preparations, because that Protocol will still be binding on the UK whether it leaves without a transition extension or not. The protocol is there in black and white and will have to be implemented. If we want it to work in the smoothest way possible, and I hope everyone in this chamber does, as the Agriculture Minister has said he does, then the last thing we need is a crash out of the transition period at the end of this year. Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, some will say, what is the point of this motion? Boris Johnson and his gang will do whatever they want and storm it is irrelevant, except that last part isn't true. The Northern Ireland Assembly is a named party to, to the withdrawal agreement at the insistence of Boris Johnson's government. That is unique. The Scottish Parliament isn't mentioned. The Welsh Assembly isn't mentioned. Dáil Éireann isn't mentioned. Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, the Bundestag isn't mentioned. But we are. The treaty says that the Northern Ireland Assembly must have a say on the continuation of the Ireland Protocol. And the command paper published by the British government just a fortnight ago said that the Northern Ireland Assembly was critical to the implementation of the Protocol and, by extension, Brexit itself. How can our voice be central to the implementation of the Protocol but irrelevant to whether the UK crashes out of the transition, when that crash out itself will be the biggest determinant of how the Protocol is implemented? Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, whether you will remain or leave, whether you are in favour or opposed to the Protocol, I would ask all members to consider whether their constituents deserve the consequences of a crash out of the transition at the end of this year in the middle of the biggest global health crisis that any of us have lived through. For too long during the past four years, this Assembly was silent 
while things were decided for the people we are elected to represent. But now we have our voice back. Let's use it. And I commend this motion to the Assembly. Thank you. I call on Rachel Woods to move the amendment that stands in her name. So moved. Thank you. You will have 10 minutes to propose your amendment and five minutes to wind. After that, all other speakers will have five minutes. I ask you to open the debate on your amendment. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. And I firstly want to thank the SDLP members for bringing this motion to the House today. The simple fact, which should not be forgotten throughout this debate, is that the global health emergency arising from the pandemic has understandably forced governments around the world to focus their attention, their priorities and resources towards tackling COVID. The workload for ministers and governments is significant, and we have acknowledged this throughout. We also know that the pandemic and the executive here's response is in the form of society-wide restrictions and an economic shutdown, which has caused and will further cause damage and hardship for all of our citizens. Ulster University's Economic Policy Centre predicts that economic output could fall by as much as 9.6% in 2020 and estimates that roughly 235,000 workers are either temporarily laid off or on furlough. Analysis from Ernest & Young notes that an approximate 6.7% contraction in the NI economy and 78,000 job losses. The most recent survey from the NI Chamber of Commerce suggests that around three in five businesses have experienced an ex a significant fall in income with most down to their last six months' worth of cash reserves. The Bank of England estimates that we will be in the worst recession in 300 years. I'm sure members agree that all of this paints a very bleak picture for us, and as many continue to point out, even in the most optimistic scenarios, there will be no return to business as usual. There will be significant changes in consumer behaviour, in investment and employment will continue on its negative trend. Mr Deputy Speaker, in the additional shock of Brexit and the looming friction in trade and burden that it places on businesses here is not welcome. In fact, it's completely reckless. The impact of COVID-19 is not only felt in economic terms and nor is the damage that will be caused by Brexit. Our amendment to the motion seeks to recognise calls to extend the transition period must take account of the shock waves that the COVID-19 crisis has sent throughout our entire society and the fact that Northern Ireland as a whole is not ready or adequately prepared for the protocol coming into effect in January. I will give way. Thank you to the member for giving way. She, uh, in giving way, she enables me to say something which I admitted to in my speech, which is that my party will be um, supporting the amendment and are grateful to the Green Party for tabling it because I think it adds to the motion. I thank the member for his intervention and for his comments. In a report published yesterday by the House of Lords Select Committee on the EU, the grim reality, endless uncertainties and serious challenges that the Brexit cliff edge poses for Northern Ireland is laid out in black and white. It states that a combination of uncertainty, lack of momentum and lack of time, compounded by the shock of the COVID-19 COVID pandemic, is a potential threat to economic prosperity and political stability in Northern Ireland. The reality is that we are months away from the Northern Ireland Protocol coming into effect and we still have no detail on how it's going to work. The fact remains that all necessary resources and work involved in preparing for it has been lost or sidelined due to the pandemic. The report notes that the contradiction at the heart of the Protocol, where Article 4 states that Northern Ireland is part of the customs ter territory of the UK, Article 5 applies to the entirety of the EU customs legislation, including the customs union, Cust union Customs Code in Northern Ireland. Still, we have no clarity on how new processes for goods moving between NI and GB will be managed and what, what the impact will be on the costs. So are we moving to a situation where goods will cost more for people living here in Northern Ireland? Coupled with our lower wages, higher poverty rates and never mind the pending res recession from COVID. The Northern Ireland Retail Consortium and the Northern Ireland Business Network have expressed frustration at the lack of engagement and outlined how onerous and expensive such checks could be, which would be hugely damaging to businesses here. As was rightly pointed out yesterday during the debate on economic recovery, what is harmful for the economy is damaging to society as a whole. And if business models prove economically unviable under the new arrangements, this will have serious knock-on effects. So we're not just talking about businesses here, we must also speak about livelihoods, about families, the pressure on public services, health, education and our environment. The protocol also addresses issues such as the rights of individuals, the common travel area and the single electricity market and north-south cooperation. 
The refusal to grant the EU's request to open an office in Belfast is a refusal by the Tories to ensure that Northern Ireland is adequately protected throughout the processes of implementing the protocol and that both sides of the withdrawal agreement fulfil their promises. Once again, as my colleague Claire Bailey pointed out back in February in this chamber, we are being held hostage to the fortune of a Prime Minister that this House does not trust, who is putting flawed ideological rhetoric ahead of the well-being of our citizens. Most remarkably, we have a party in this executive, the DUP, who follow him blindly into the chaos while the rest of us despair. DUP MPs in Westminster voted for regressive new immigration legislation that would severely limit the number of people that could come and live and work in Northern Ireland and contribute to our economy and our society. This is the same legislation that the Minister for the Economy acknowledged would cause serious difficulties for the agri-food industry and hospitality sector here in an answer to my written question. DUP MPs in Westminster also voted in favour of legislation that deliberately excluded minimum standards on food post-Brexit, an absolutely shocking move with the Agriculture Bill described by former MP Jim Nicholson as potentially the last nail in the coffin for agriculture in Northern Ireland. We have no indication if Minister Poots will follow the lead of other devolved administrations that have made provision to develop agriculture legislation that addresses their own needs. I will give way. The member for giving way. As, as I understand it, this debate is about whether we need more time to negotiate with the European Union, whereas what the member is doing is criticising decisions that have already been made. Thank the member for his intervention, but this is all part of the debate, and I will continue to get to my point of why we need a transition period extended. So this surely must be done before the end of the transition period to keep our hard-fought standards and protections in place and build on them in the future. Of course, we learned yesterday that the DUP refused a proposal to the executive to call for an extension to the transition period. This is not surprising, given the examples that I mention. It appears that there are some more concerned with a fanciful dream of leaving the EU than the evidence staring us all in the face that Northern Ireland is on the brink, that this crisis we are all facing now will be compounded by an even bigger one if we don't act now. So, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, at the end of April, we learned that the Brexit subcommittee was scrapped, presumably because of urgent decisions that needed progressed while COVID crisis engulfed all government businesses, and that the policies and approaches are now discussed in private at the executive table. So how then is this assembly able to properly scrutinise and provide genuine suggestions and recommendations around the issue of the protocol, Brexit and its implication for Northern Ireland? The subcommittee was also a part of the NDNA agreement, but now it's gone. So where is it? Where is the impact assessment that we were promised? Is this an example of dodging difficult questions and scrutiny? We are several weeks away from a deadline in which the British government has the opportunity to call for an extension to the transition period. We should follow the other devolved administrations and send a clear signal to Westminster that Northern Ireland needs this time to recover from the pandemic and prepare for the protocol coming into effect. We are the region most affected most inextricably intertwined with the negotiations, and so far, the executive has done the least out of all devolved regions in calling for such an extension. Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, it is not just businesses suffering as a result of COVID-19, and it's not just businesses that will need to prepare for new arrangements arising out of Brexit. We must recognise the difficulties and uncertainties that exist across our society, the issues that we are facing in terms of domestic violence, abuse, mental health, social care, and many others. So we must not see any reductions in rights, standards or protections, and if required, the executive must step up and must bring forward legislation before the transition period ends. So I would urge all members to support the motion as amended today. Thank you. <coughs> Excuse me. Thank you. Uh, from this point on, all members will have five minutes to speak. I call Mr Mervyn Storey. The principal speaker. Sir Francis Bacon once said, Reading make of a broad man, speaking a ready man, writing an exact man. And if, of course that forces you to read what people have written. And in doing so gives you a sense of where are they really coming from. And despite all the words that we have seen both in the motion and in the amendment, it brings us back to one salient point that there are those who are still opposed to us leaving the undemocratic and over-bureaucratic European Union. 
and they will stop at nothing to overturn the democratic decision of the people of the United Kingdom over four years ago to leave the European Union. In this motion today and in the amendment, they have decided to employ the current COVID-19 crisis and to use it as a mask to cover their real intention, and that is to deny the democratic wish of the UK exercised through the ballot box. And I have to say to the member who proposed the motion, coming from a party that claims that they were the advocates of democracy and one man, one vote, and recognising the ballot paper and all of that, it seems as though that now you can set all of that aside when it doesn't suit and the outcome is not what you got. But I think that members, we need also to recognise that however, they are not alone in this regard because we have seen EU negotiators and their supporters ruthlessly exploiting the current global crisis, particularly in relation to economies that are in meltdown. They use the same flawed arguments as we have heard already in this chamber this afternoon. But of course, why wouldn't the EU want further delay? And of course, it would mean one thing, that the, e that the United Kingdom would continue to pay. And of course, the paymaster general has decided to leave the club. That's why Europe was in such a quandary and in such a political tizzy when the democratic wish of the United Kingdom was expressed via the ballot box. And of course, the paymaster general in the United Kingdom has decided that it's also taking the checkbook. But Europe would like us to continue and they would like us to have be still contributing to their coffers. It also means that the UK cannot benefit from any free trade deals that it wants to engage in. And what we have heard is a panacea of doom, of worry, of fear, rather than grasping the opportunities of being unshackled from a system that is undemocratic and is riddled with inconsistencies and financial uh, inappropriate behaviour. Of course, this also has to be uh, reminded that the, extending to the, the extension to the transition period could cost the United Kingdom government somewhere in the region of 380 billion. But then, of course, those who believe that all you have to do is just ask for more money, you'll get it. And you, the bigger the bowl, the bigger the receipt. But there are consequences for the extension. There would be consequences if we were not to fulfill the obligation. An extension to the transition period would prevent us from taking what is needed, those radical steps to rebuild post-COVID economy because the United Kingdom would continue to be bound by the EU rules and unable to influence them. What more ludicrous for members to come to this House who talk about scrutiny and getting more information and having more detail when rules would be made in Brussels that could not be changed in Belfast. Therefore, Members, time Mr. Is Deputy up. Principal Speaker, there's much more we could say in relation to this issue. We will be opposing both the amendment and the motion. Okay. We look forward to the completion of our removal from the European Union. I call on Mrs. Martina Anderson. Going to Agud, a last free can call you. But while I'm Lord, say Father, and Ruin Shaw, August, and Lasso uh, Foster, I stand here to speak in favour of both the, the motion and the amendment. The majority in this assembly do not support Brexit. The majority in the North do not support Brexit. And yet, in just under seven months' time, 
the British government is prepared to drag us over a Brexit cliff. Now, the Irish protocol in the withdrawal agreement is without doubt an ugly compromise. But ugly as it is, it's going to stop a harder border on the island of Ireland. And Brexit and partition are also ugly impositions put on the shoulders of the majority of the people in Ireland against our will. Brexit is stripping away our democratic rights and the partition of Ireland is the reason for that. Yet Brexit has accelerated a new dynamic into the conversation about Irish unity and I want to acknowledge the EU's Council statement that it made and the contribution it made in, on the political momentum for change and for ending partition and advancing Irish unity when on the 29th of April 2017 the EU Council said that in the event of reunification the whole of Ireland will remain in the EU. So I acknowledge the work undertaken in the EU to protect the Good Friday Agreement in all of its parts with Article 2.1 of the Protocol stating that there would be no diminution of Good Friday Agreement rights. Our communities, our businesses and our people are battling with COVID-19. That's a reality. So they are not even slightly prepared for what could hit us at the end of this year. Even the most fanatical Brexiteers know that. So we need an extension to the transition period and the clock is ticking as such an extension needs to be agreed by the Joint Committee in four weeks time. Many businesses will be shocked as they battle to come to terms with a border control post and custom checks in the Irish Sea because they are simply going to happen. And they ha there's been no preparation, no work to help businesses to deal with all of that. People in the North are going to suffer from bill shocks, paying for Roman charges post-transition. Community organisations, the length and breadth of the North, whether they come from the Shankill or come from Gallia, women's groups, organisations that are going to see 3.5 billion of European funding lost to the North. Workers from across Europe who have made the North their home, who enrich our society, who bring skills and talent. But Brexit has them feeling unwanted and unwelcome, compounded, compounded, I have to say, by comments, some carelessly made even by the authors of this motion and people who feel unwanted and unwelcome are leaving. So if we are fortunate enough to live through this deadly pandemic with an economy that has thus far been hit with the equivalent of three economic recessions, the last thing, the last thing that we need is to go over a Brexit cliff on the 1st of January next year. So we do need an extension and it would be absolutely foolish not to allow people to prepare for a border in the Irish Sea. The Scot Scotland and the Welsh governments have both called for an extension and the EU chief and negotiator Michelle Barney has said that the EU is prepared to offer an extension up to 2022. So let's grab the opportunity for our society, for our business, for our workers, for our environment. And I know Philip McGuigan uh, is very much focused on what's going to, the impact it's going to have on our environment. And most of all, for all of our people. So for all of those reasons and many, many more that I could go into, we support both the motion and the amendment before us today. Mr. Steve Aiken. Yes, indeed, Mr. Uh, Principal, uh, Deputy Speaker. Uh, I rise at this time to say that we in the Ulster Unionist Party cannot support this motion and this amendment. While we understand the desire of the SDLP and the Green Party to raise these issues, but after the discussions of the executive yesterday, when it was unanimously decided to wait until this current phase of negotiations has played out, 
We fail at this stage rather than debating, we should be debating the reality of the Irish Sea border, which is the basis of our own amendment that was regrettably not taken by the Speaker. That the discussions today will only be seized upon and utilised by those who wish to seek bargaining advantage between Mr Frost and Mr Barnier and those who seek to maintain further material advantage at the expense of everyone in Northern Ireland. The UUP recognises that today marks the start of a very critical phase of the negotiations between the UK and the EU. Discussions where the future economic and social well-being of Northern Ireland are purportedly central to the outcome of any agreement that may or may not be made. We note that over the last four years in the ensuing debate, but regrettably not in this Assembly, there has been a common theme which always apparently has placed the Belfast Agreement as the main feature of all discussions. Indeed, the interpretation of the principles of that agreement are what, we, what all actors have said to be the driving force of their deliberations res with respect to maintaining a minimalistic as possible impact on Northern Ireland and its economy. This, regrettably, forms as a form of code speak that disguises the more realistic assessment that compared to level playing fields, financial passports, modified movements, security and fisheries, Northern Ireland is but unfortunately a mere bargaining chip in these discussions. That is as regrettable as it is inevitable. And indeed, if this Assembly voted and passed a motion by cross-community assent today, we'd be certain that our position would be utilised as another part of that discussion. Because regardless of what some members may think, the interests of Northern Ireland compared to those against those of the EU members' national priorities will not be put to the fore. Indeed, with the lack of details on the derogation of what is deemed at-risk goods, the overriding and primary jurisdiction of the Court of Justice of the European Union, where we're going to have to remain part of the Euro Union Customs Code, and all that entails, the technical and environmental legislations, VAT and excise, the single electricity market and state aid, all coupled with the primacy of EU executive agencies within Northern Ireland, has been admitted by the UK government that to the European Court still has the jurisdiction over the UK with respect to Northern Ireland and it has it, than it has over the member states, which is to say on infringement proceedings and the ability to fine. That will give unelected EU officials considerable power that we as Assembly will have no say over, bringing the very real threat of a Northern Ireland business trading exclusively within our UK market, having goods described by an EU official as being at risk, being hauled in front of the ECJ without any recourse of appeal to our United Kingdom Supreme Court. This also raises the issue of when we're going to debate these issues. When are we going to be briefed on differential VAT requirements, the implications of state aid rules, the impact of the so-called level playing field, when any EU country will be able to challenge our Northern Ireland executive's decision, for instance on reduced VAT on tourism or on APD, without any recourse outside an unelected and unaccountable joint committee. The Certainly. The, any talk of extension uh, of the uh, Northern Ireland and UK remaining in Europe will occur after the UK people and Parliament have voted to leave. And as such, the, e the UK budgetary rebate will, has come to an end already, and any decision will be very, very costly. Does the member agree with me that rather than continuing to kick the can down the road, the negotiators should be getting in there and minimising the bureaucracy that is going to land on Northern Ireland business and cost our consumers in the future. Yes, indeed, and thank you uh, very Mr Riffin, you, you have an additional minute. Oh, thank you very much indeed. Um, but so much for taking back control. The costs of all these will be significant. The reality of a tax on goods coming into Northern Ireland from the rest of our own country a Tesco ASDA tax, if you will, when like-for-like like goods will be more expensive here and will indeed be a permanent reminder to some parties of the folly of both supporting Brexit and supporting Boris Johnson's totally worthless reassurances. How no paperwork can be translated into electronic declarations definitely belies some recent assertions that the result of the end of the transition period will result in a cost and regulation free option. I don't think that is ever going to happen. So rather than debating these issues today, we're talking about a motion that all parties in the executive have decided to look at again when some actual detail is known. We should instead be asking our executive, in particular the Executive Office, Agriculture, Finance and Economy Departments, 
to tell us in detail what the likely mitigation factors are, what we will need and how we will need to pay for them, the cost of bespoke customs and declaration systems, the compensation and regulation costs for our consumers, recruitment and training costs and all the excess regulations as we have. In short, why we need a comprehensive plan delivered by all the executive parties into preparing for the oncoming end of the transition period. Rather than debating and raising expectations on a highly improbable outcome, we should wait until they see the shape of the outcome of these talks and then, dependent on those talks, decide then what our approach should be. Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, today was unfortunately a wasted opportunity. We will be not supporting either motion. Call Mr. John Blair. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. I rise today on behalf of Alliance to support the timely and very relevant motion and the amendment also. And I wish to take this opportunity to thank those responsible uh, for bringing these forward. I can assure you, Principal Deputy Speaker, at the outset, I have no intention uh, of making any attempt to re rehearse leave versus remain arguments because this is not, as I'm sure all of us could agree, a leave versus remain debate. This is a debate centred on how we address very serious and imminent problems. The challenging time frame of just one year to negotiate a comprehensive free trade agreement has been made impossible by the onset of coronavirus. No one takes any comfort from that position. We know that the UK and Irish governments and the three devolved assemblies and the EU have rightly diverted their focus and resources into dealing with this crisis and emergency, leaving an extensive list of questions surrounding Brexit unanswered, and that too is a reality. Yet time, Principal Deputy Speaker, has continued to pass, and self-imposed deadlines loom ever closer. An extension to the transition period is therefore essential to ensure that any systems and mechanisms put in place are workable and have been thought out and scrutinised to the best of our collective ability. These decisions should not be made on the basis of rushed through processes during the time of a unprecedented public health crisis. They should be considered carefully. There has been much commentary already about the compelling economic and social reasons why the transition period should be extended, but today I will focus on specifics within the Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs brief that I cover for my party. And I, Principal Deputy Speaker, can assure members from across the House that I raise these issues for no other reason than that they are questions I have raised many times and to which I have received very few or no answers or clarification at all. And these concerns centre around mainly infrastructure, our ports, migrant labour and the future also of, of fishing rights. The UK's approach to the Northern Ireland Protocol, published last month, finally acknowledged that new infrastructure will be required to check goods coming into Northern Ireland from Great Britain. The need for this new infrastructure at our ports uh, had been apparent, it seems, to basically everyone for some time, yet the UK government has left it only a few months before the end of the transition period to even acknowledge that necessity. The fact that we do not have any detail whatsoever on how these checks will work in practice is also extremely concerning. Businesses in Northern Ireland have no clarity on the administrative burden that is about to be placed upon them. We simply need that extension, Principal Deputy Speaker, to the transition period to ensure that any checks put in place work effectively and efficiently without further disrupting east-west trade. Additionally, we, have just one, we are just one month away from the deadline, the 1st of July detailed in the political declaration to secure an agreement on fishing rights. Again, this is incredibly problematic for the Northern Ireland fishing industry, and there has been, again, no clarity at all on local fishing boundaries. At what point in Carlingford Lock, for example, does a fishing trawler pass from UK waters into Irish or EU waters? At what point in the RAC does that happen also? What are the practical difficulties? One I've raised myself a number of times, including on the floor of this House. What are the practical difficulties of moving from one jurisdiction to five or to six, if you include the Isle of Man? The clock is ticking and no answers are being provided to these questions. An extension to the transition period, therefore, is the course of action that will ensure a fair and sensible solution to fishing rights in the post-Brexit era. Lastly, we need further assessment of the impact that the UK Government's proposed post-Brexit immigration system will have on our vital agri-food industry. 
the high wage threshold and the very dubious classifications of migrant workers into skilled and unskilled workers could have a severe impact on our economy. Alliance is committed to seeking special mitigations for Northern Ireland in any Brexit scenario. Immigration policy simply must take our local circumstances into account. Again, extending the transition period therefore allows us the breathing space to craft an uh, immigration system that is fair to both migrants and also to each region of the UK, rather than pursuing hastily arranged legislation based on someone else's Little Englander philosophy. <coughs> to conclude, Principal Deputy Speaker, the impact of coronavirus has damaged government planning and left us with a series of unanswered questions regarding the Northern Ireland Protocol and post-Brexit structures. Extending the transition period will give us time and breathing space to create mechanisms to minimise any negative impact of leaving the EU and to reduce economic and social disruption. Therefore, supporting the motion and the amendment. Okay, I call Mr Paul Frew. Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, and I rise here in the chamber today to assert the claim that I am probably the most pro-European MLA in this chamber. I love Europe. I love its peoples. I love its history. Fascinated by its architecture and, and history, and I love Europe. I'm also, by design, because I am the most pro-European and the most anti-EU. Because what the EU chooses to become is a question that no one in this chamber can answer. And fair play to the SDLP, because throughout their history, they've been very pro EU and common market before it. But I suggest that even they, some of the members, can't answer that question and grapple with that question as to what the EU will become. The bureaucratic giant that it already is, how will that ever be conducive and good to democratic processes in the, on the continent of Europe in the future? I just, it's beyond me. My natural home in politics is one of libertarianism, not to be confused in many occasions in this House with liberalism. But it's, it's, I can't understand the logic how anybody that would be a libertarian could support the beast that is the EU and the, the direction of travel in which it's going. Now, I will defend the right of any MLA to bring a motion, private member's motion, to this Assembly Chamber to debate. So you've got, got me there, absolutely, and I'll debate it with you graciously. And I, I respect the SDLP for their, that it's in their DNA to support this. But I can't help but think that a, a transition, what is the motive for a transition at this period? Is it to try and stifle and ruin and wreck and sabotage the British negotiating stance and positions. Because if it is, that will be harmful to us all. What really takes me to the fair is the party opposite. The party opposite are the biggest anti-EU party in this island, have been all their history. It just happens to be they were very quiet coming up to the referendum. Very quiet indeed, not like them. Very quiet. And then all of a sudden when they've seen the results, my goodness, how they turn tail. And now they're the biggest pro-EU party about. And because they try to rewrite history all the time. I will go, yeah. Well, I know you think you understand Sinn Féin's policy position. But quite clearly, from your utterance here in the chamber, you haven't a clue. Uh, excuse me, Ms Anderson, engaged. can I just say, all comments should be directed through okay. the chair. Through the chair. Sinn Féin critically engages with the EU and has always critically engaged with the EU. And in fact, just to say to the member um, that as we were coming up to the Brexit referendum, and indeed a way at the beginning before even the date was set, the Sinn Féin went on a diplomatic offensive, and I actually led our position against Brexit along with the late Mark McGuinness. So we were very clear, Chair, about our position, and we've critically engaged with the EU, and since the referendum, lots of other 
delegations in the European Parliament. They all wanted to critically engage with the EU. So we actually did something that resulted in many other delegations coming on board to our position. Member has an extra minute. The should be short. Uh, the, the fact is, Sinn Féin sold their soul to the EU to create a divisive matter on this island and in Northern Ireland itself. Did you remember Yes, I will. That will be quick. Remember that the former president of Sinn Féin said that the bankers of the EU treaty were Thatcherites, and that was the former president of Sinn Féin, Gerry Adams, who can't remember that he was in an illegal organisation. Yeah. And, and, and so I can't understand, I can't understand how any libertarian worth the salt could support the bureaucratic nightmare that the EU is and will become increasingly to its peoples. And I'm glad for one that we are, the UK is getting out. The problem now for this country, this nation here in Northern Ireland, is the protocol and the damaging effect that that will do. And the aggressive nature that the EU have taken upon Northern Ireland, they have basically held us hostage. They have seen the UK leaving out the door and they've basically grabbed little Northern Ireland to use it as nothing more but a bargaining chip. In the only way the EU knows how, by negotiation. Now that's not a place that any of us should be. And if the most rem ardent remainer here in this chamber thinks that by prolonging an agony without trying to get a settled view once and for all to move forward, then they're only heaping more damage onto the businesses business community and the peoples here in Northern Ireland. And that's something that I cannot ever support. Uh, we, have, we, have seen, we have seen the aggressive nature of the EU at its worst throughout these negotiations. And I, it surprised me, because I would have been, you know, OK, give the people the choice, give the referendum result to the people to decide. But I never thought my worst nightmares, the EU's stance and aggressive nature towards this little part of the world would be so intense. Members, time is up. Thank you. I call Mr. Philip McGuigan. Gura Melgut, Pariel Laskan Collier, and I will uh, stand to speak in favour and support of the motion and the amendment. And I'm delighted to be following my constituency colleague who explained the difference between libertarian and liberalism. I, I can assure him that nobody will ever mistake him as a supporter of liberalism. Uh, it's actually indicative of the do dogmatic, uh, destructive, insular-looking and xenophobic policies of English Tories unfortunately supported and backed by the DUP in this House and others here, that we actually need to be having this debate on the subject. Uh, an extension to the Brexit process in the context of the current coronavirus pandemic should be plain common sense, I would have thought. The key priority for this Assembly or any other elected chambers on this island or neighbouring island or indeed across Europe for that matter over the next period of months needs to be about protecting the lives of our citizens and protecting our businesses, jobs and economy against the impacts of COVID-19, the worst health and economic crisis we have faced in over 100 years. Businesses here in the North are worried about their imminent futures and survival. The last thing they need is the shock of another crisis, a Tory DUP made crisis that they are ill prepared for. I could add our farmers, the agri-food sector, tourism, hospitality and every other sector of society on the north to that list. The majority of people here voted against Brexit and rightly so. There is no such thing as a good Brexit. Uh, the British government have been reckless and cavalier about the impact of Brexit on our economy, our peace process and our society here in the north from day one. And that's not just my view. The report from the British House of Lords Select Committee on the EU has found that the British government approach to Brexit poses a potential threat to economic prosperity and stability of the North, unlike the rosy, sunny uplands as predicted by the DUP and others. The Irish Protocol, uh, as my colleague explained, was a hard fought for and hard won minimum protection against the worst elements of Brexit destruction. However, given the disdain shown by the British government to the views of the people here in the North, this protocol and its implementation in full is vital, and this will take time to work out for businesses uh, to adapt and prepare for. 
Uh, as Sinn Féin Environment spokesperson, I am well aware of the concerns about the impact that Brexit could have with regard to environmental protections here in the North. As with all kinds of issues, there is real fear that the British government want to lower and regress from current environmental standards. The British government is introducing a, an environment bill uh, at Westminster in an attempt to plug the gaps of environmental protections left wide open by their Brexit debacle. It is the view of myself, Sinn Féin and many other local environmental activists and NGOs that this bill marks a significant weakening of protections and regulations currently enjoyed by EU membership. Not only do we lose many EU directives and regulations, but the directives and regulations that this bill attempts to emulate are to be enforced by a new uh, OEP, Office of Environmental Protection, with very weak enforcement powers. So a disorderly exit could cause major environmental headaches on the island of Ireland in the absence of clear common rulebook regarding species, emissions, water quality and hazard, hazardous waste. It's the firm view of Sinn Féin there can be no regression from EU environmental standards or regulations of an all-Ireland nature. As COVID-19 has clearly shown us, there are no borders on this island for viruses and the same applies to your environment. It would make no sense whatsoever to have one set of environmental protections and rules in Derry and a different set in Donegal, Newry or Dundalk or even Dublin from Dunloy. There must be a shared and harmonised regulatory, uh, regulatory approach. So, in conclusion, uh, I just want to again thank uh, the members for bringing the motion and the amendment, uh, which we will be supporting. The, the people of this island and in the north in particular need time to work through the current price, crisis uh, in the best interests of all our citizens. Thank you. I call Sinead McLaughlin. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. I think it is fair to say that leaving the European Union hasn't been easy. I think it is also fair to say that our economy is enduring unprecedented strain due to the pandemic. I think it is also fair to say that we cannot have a bounce-back recovery. The economic impact of COVID is devastating. And can I ask the House, no matter how much you supported Brexit, these unforeseen realities now call for more time, more clarity and more preparation. Failure to agree a deal with the EU, and there is precious little time left, is not in the interest of those who voted remain or leave in the referendum. Let's look at what we are dealing with and what is intended to be the last seven months of this transition period. The House of Lords EU Select Committee has just given its judgment on obstacles outstanding. It says, Northern Ireland feels like pawns in a bigger game played between the EU, UK government and the EU. It says, and I quote, for Northern Ireland's people, businesses, stakeholders, the protocol represents what one witness called a seismic change and very little time is left before it comes operational. It is unclear what impact the protocol will have on Northern Ireland after the UK enters new trade agreements and that the same with the EU trade agreements. It is unclear how the movement of goods will be checked. It is unclear what the definitions will be used for goods potentially posing a risk to the EU single market and how goods will be classified as being for the internal UK trade. It is unclear what declarations will be required for goods travelling from Great Britain to Northern Ireland. It is unclear how goods sent from Northern Ireland to Great Britain will have unfettered access to the GB market. It is unclear how Northern Ireland businesses will operate VAT rules for next year. It is unclear how state rules will be applied in Northern Ireland. Meanwhile, the technical advisory group that was supposed to propose alternative arrangements is in abeyance. These are just a few of the points raised by the House of Lords Committee. Yes, certainly. I mean, would the member agree with the, all of the lack of clarity that, that she has just detailed, that within the structures that we have here within the North, there's supposed to be a joint consultative working group, which hasn't even met, and yet it is supposed to provide its feedback 
its feedback, its expertise, its understanding of what the impact of Brexit will be through to the negotiations so that a decision can be taken in a few weeks as to whether or not we need to exit at the end of the year. That in all of this lack of clarity, this is what we need. We need time to be able to get clarity. The member is entitled to an extra minute, but I would warn members not to take a minute to earn their colleagues an extra minute. I, absolute, I absolutely agree with the member. You know, we're really running out of time here and we have no governance and no scrutiny. And that seems to be a theme of, of this executive going forward, as we heard in the previous debate. Um, we have also had a report from the Institute of Government which makes many of the same points, but even more. It warns the UK government capacity has been sucked out by the COVID-19 crisis, making it difficult to negotiate with the EU. Members, I can tell you that capacity within the Northern Ireland executive has been absorbed by COVID-19 as well and has not concentrated in any uh, meaningful way on, on what we're facing uh, in, with, towards Brexit. It warns that the Irish sea border will look more like the border between England and France than between England and Scotland. It warns that 64 different administrations in the UK will have a role in administering the Irish sea border. It doubts if negotiations can be completed in time. It doubts if the border can be operational by the end of the year. Underlying all of this, says the Institute for Government, are the core challenges. The Institute says UK and EU negotiators see, negotiators see the negotiations differently. The UK wants to amend the protocol. The EU wants to agree how it is implemented. The UK trade negotiator has accepted that there will be friction in trade between the UK and EU in order to create benefits for the UK. Many of those frictions will apply to trade between Great Britain and Northern Ireland. We hear every day of the need to take expert advice when it comes to COVID. We should take expert advice when it comes to the transition arrangements. That expert advice is clear. We have to extend the transition period. Time is now too short to resolve the vast number of technical challenges that we face, certainly. Thank you, Member, for giving way. Would you accept that one of the expert advice, or one of the experts that has given us advice in relation to Europe is uh, a Sinn Féin MLA, a Sinn Féin MEP, uh, who in 2016 said that the economic and fiscal policies of the European Union have had a catastrophic effect on the lives of many of its citizens. And yet, this is the party is telling us that uh, Europe is a wonderful place and we never should have left it. Thank you, Member, for your intervention. I just want to indicate this is not about Brexit or uh, Remain. This conversation is about are we ready and we are not. Mr Principal, Deputy Speaker, I agree with my colleague Matthew O'Toole. This Assembly was silent while things were decided for the people we represent. We now have a voice, and this motion should be approved unanimously by this Assembly. It is not in the interests of anyone, whether they voted Remain or whether they voted Leave in the referendum, to have a disorganised exit. It is certainly not in the interests of wider society, workers, businesses, um, to lay a crisis on top of the immediate one. So let us display unit here today by supporting this no motion. Okay. I ask this chamber, can we just deal with one crisis Members time at is a up. time? I commend you. The members' the time is up. The Thank you. Thank you. Um, there's about, I think I have three more members, and I need to be calling um, Rich, Rachel Woods at one minute past five, so there is time for everyone to get in if we're reasonable. Uh, I call Mr Declan McAleer. Uh, thank you, Ms. Uh, and I'd like to take the opportunity to welcome this motion and commend those who are able to see you this afternoon. Um, as most of us will know, the, um, the whole Brexit debacle has created a huge impact on the agri-food sector. And as I said in yesterday's uh, motion, we have uh, 25,000 frontline farmers uh, who support 48,000 people employed in the food and uh, drinks uh, trade right across the north, with, an average, with the turnover last year 4.5 billion. So the, um, the sector here really had been under pressure with the COVID crisis, uh, and I am aware that um, the industry had been lobbying the minister, and indeed we would have found out through the committee and our engagements that they want it paused to give uh, more time. Uh, so this motion, certainly, what we're hearing today, I feel is in line with the overwhelming majority of the sectoral voices within the, the agri-food sector. 
Um, again, uh, as I said yesterday, it's, this sector is particularly vulnerable. Uh, we export 87% uh, of the agri-food produced here in the north. A good bit of that goes to Europe, and a huge amount of it goes across the water to Britain. So the implementation of this protocol is absolutely, um, absolutely crucial. Um, we do need unfettered access to the rest of Ireland uh, and indeed the EU. We also need uh, unfettered access across the water to Britain as well, which, indeed, which is a, a very big, um, a huge market for agri-food from here. But there is, in line with what the speaker said earlier, there, there, is, there is a lot of uncertainty. There's uncertainty around tariffs, around VAT, around the uh, regulatory uh, divergence, which we're seeing Britain move away from uh, the rest of the, uh, the EU. And I suppose, um, just reflecting back on some comments earlier, it was actually, um, you know, it's easy to sort of to blame the EU, and we have critically engaged the EU, led by Martina and others, but it was the British government's decision to implement Brexit and to diverge on a regular basis from, uh, from the EU. And they are, have actually created the, the likelihood of the possibility of additional checks at our ports here uh, in line with that. And indeed, it was a, I'm just referring here to the technical note, the, it was the British government that has committed to a plan to here, the north of Ireland, Annex 2 of the protocol, which relates to phytosanitary and sanitary requirements for all of our agri-goods, ag animals, plants, and their products entering in the north from either a third country or Britain must comply with EU SPS requirements. And the north is, is a, a unique place, and that was reflected in August 2016 in the letter from Arlene Foster and Martin McGuinness to the then Prime Minister, Mrs May, recognising that and recognising that agriculture as one of those uh, areas which needs to be a special uh, solution needed uh, for, for it here. But the worrying thing is, is that um, in terms of access to the British market, there's that uncertainty. But, even, but also on the, on the technical note uh, to the Commission, uh, most recently, they made the point that, um, that, that, that they should clarify where they intend to have additional posts for the performance of controls in the north, such as at Larne. And if this does not happen, there will be no entry point solution for live animals and for products of animal origin across the water, which could create a significant risk of disruption of trade flows entering here. So there is a, there's a huge, huge uh, challenge facing us here. And then, you know, whatever your view is in the EU, it's been brought about by the fact that the British government decided to take us out of the EU, the British government has decided to diverge away from the regulations of the EU, and then, the, 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 and then, and then hang on, the DUP then undermined Theresa May's deal, which then has created the possibility of this re regulatory border. So, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Referring to the British government that took us out, does he accept that the ballot box is, I know that his party was aligned to the, an armalite in one hand and a ballot box in another, but I thought they had, they had made some progress and that the ballot box was primary and had primacy. Will he accept that the United Kingdom, of which we are a part, voted to leave? That's the reason. It wasn't one individual. It was the people of the United Kingdom. Yes or no? The member has an additional minute. Thank you. Thank you for that extra minute, Mr. Story. Um, I represent the people of West Rome, and 77 per cent of people in West Rome vote to remain and the vast majority of people in the north would to remain also. So that's, that's, who we, that's who we represent. And if you want to re refer to the British Parliament, that's OK. But it was England that took us out of, uh, out of the EU, not Scotland, and certainly not here. So, so no, I, I, we represent here, and that's the most important point, and we want to rep represent the interests of people here. And indeed, the letter from Arlene Foster and Martin McGuinness in August 2016 Reference that as well that this is a very unique place here. No, this is different, okay? Because because of the situation that we have. So the point is, industry, agri-food industry wants a pause. Um, the other big thing, and it's, it's totally connected to this, is, is the British Agriculture Bill. And I know we're talking about transition, but this is so important. The British Agriculture Bill did not accept that Food Standards Amendment. Did not protect. Uh, Britain from the importation of low standard goods. And that again raises the possibility how are we going to stop low standard foods getting in here and again flags up the possibility how is all this going to be checked. The immigration, the point space immigration system that the Home Office talked about in recent times, a huge impact for seasonal agriculture workers. So just in conclusion, 
commend the, the, the motion uh, today and we'll offer our full hearted support behind it. Graham Agoff. Mr. Mike Nesbitt. Principal Deputy Speaker, if there were to be a time to call for an extension, this is not it. And I am glad to hear that the Executive came to that conclusion yesterday. I also note that Mr Blair thinks that today's debate and the call today is timely. And as I hate to see such a bad split in the Alliance Party, maybe he wants to have a word with his party leader uh, about how she behaved at the Executive yesterday. Now, you, you can have an extension. You can extend by a year, you can extend by five years, but at some point, you're going to have to start making decisions. And that is my concern. Four years on, we are still the most affected, but, but least prepared region of, of the United Kingdom for this withdrawal. And it's not just negotiations between the UK government and the EU, it's us with the UK government. I mean, it's less than two weeks since the Cabinet Office published the latest periodic report on negotiations between the UK government and the devolved administrations. And the Scottish and the Welsh, I'll give way in a minute, the Scottish and the Welsh and the UK government agreed in October 2017 the principles that would inform the common frameworks which will govern the UK single market after transition. Now, of course, we didn't because we didn't have a devolved administration then, but we've had one for months now. And yet, that document says we haven't agreed those principles. And I've had a look at the principles, and I don't understand the problem. For example, the first thing it says was these common frameworks will enable the functioning of the UK internal market while acknowledging policy divergence. Well, surely then we need ministers in those negotiations, not civil servants who can only give factual input. We need elected reps who can talk about policy. For example, who can say, because we are so dependent on air transportation, in fact, we're more dependent than any other region of the UK outside of the Highlands and Islands of Scotland, air passenger duty disproportionately and negatively impacts our economy. The principles also deal with justice, which have cross-border elements, and with the security of the United Kingdom. Why are we going to be silent about that? And for how long will we be silent? It also respects the devolution settlements and the democratic accountability of devolved legislations. But it says that they will not normally be adjusted, those competences, without our consent. And yet, Section 12 of the EU Withdrawal Act allows the UK government to temporarily freeze devolved competence. In other words, they can impose regulations on us, regulations we don't like, and that could be injurious to our economy, but beneficial to the rest of Great Britain. Why are we silent on this? I give way to the member for Fulwell. I just thought I'd give you an extra minute, minute there. No, um, does the member agree that um, there is a very short period of time for the UK government to make a request for an extension of the transition? When do you think it is a, the good time for the UUP to get in, uh, engaged? Because we've got four weeks left. I, I, I reckon it's time to start talking and, and making your mind up. Well, I thank the member for, for her intervention, but actually, Principal Deputy Speaker, that question needs to be directed to Nicola Mallon, who was a minister at the executive yesterday when they agreed that this is not the time. It was... Uh, excuse oh. me. Oh. It is not and never in order for a member to say to another member, that's not true. Mr Nesbitt, thank you. Thank you, Principal Deputy uh, Speaker. Per perhaps Mr McLaughlin is privy to more information than I am of a conversation at an executive which is supposed to be, to be private. Anyway, the principles we, we have not agreed, they, they're not silent on the protocol. Um, they recognise the economic and social linkages between Northern Ireland and Ireland, and that will be the only part of the UK with a land border with the European Union. And importantly, I believe, they also say that they will adhere to the Belfast Agreement. So again, I ask the question, what is there to disagree with? Why haven't we signed up to those principles that were agreed by everybody else in October of 2017? There's also a five-phase approach to common frameworks. And at phase two, which we have hit with some of the frameworks, the devolved administration portfolio ministers 
which I understand in this case to be the ministers of the executive office, are supposed to agree the policy direction. But this does not appear to have happened. Uh, there's also uh, the UK government has sought to develop a shared cross-cutting approach to the UK internal market with the Welsh government and the Scottish government, but they've only had factual input from the Northern Ireland Civil Service. Why? Officials from the UK, Welsh and Scottish governments have developed a joint approach for formal parliamentary scrutiny of frameworks. We haven't. Why are, not, why are we not being consulted by the Northern Ireland Executive? And finally, on the protocol, we're hearing that the UK government and our executive are meeting to determine the impact on both individual frameworks and the programme as a whole. This is through analysis. Analysis. I believe it is time for decisions. And indeed, as two members at least have mentioned, yesterday the House of Lords published a 100-page report on the Ireland-Northern Ireland Protocol highlighting serious contradictions. In language I'm sure you wouldn't hear in the House of Lords, I believe that it is time for us to get our finger right. Call Kelly Armstrong. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, as my colleague has stated, the Alliance Party supports the motion and the amendment. The amendment in particular because it extends to include all society and recognises the crisis that we currently are in. Alliance has made our position clear on this over a long period. Indeed, Alliance MP Stephen Farry raised the issue of extending the period for negotiations due to the challenges of COVID-19 at Prime Minister's questions on the 18th of March. This is not, as others have said, a remain versus leave matter. It's about having the time for negotiations on a UK-EU future relationship. I don't understand why people think this is a bad thing. Brexit has happened, but the deals are not yet done. One year was already a very ambitious and unrealistic timetable. It's now even more challenging with COVID-19 crisis. Government needs to be focusing its resources on managing that crisis and the aftermath. Also, only so much that businesses can do and other stakeholders can manage in terms of bandwidth. We have sole traders and we have self-employed people who have not received any support from this assembly yet. We are still waiting on that. There are charities that have not received finance grants yet. But we expect those people to take their, their focus away from surviving to planning for the withdrawal agreement and what's going to happen after December. The end of the implementation period also entails the end of rights of freedom of movement. That has particular implications for key aspects of our economy and society, and in particular our health service and social care at a time of extreme stress due to COVID-19. Is anybody addressing this? No. Government is running things very tight on a timescale for agreeing its future relationship with the EU. This is more than just about economic and trade, but it's also about matters such as placing and security. A no deal, a no trade deal, or a retreat to what is termed WTO rules, or an Australia style deal will have a, a severe impact on the UK economy as a whole. The UK will be distance, distancing itself needlessly from its nearest and most important market. Many independent economic studies alongside the Treasury have already indicated that this would be the most damaging scenario. Some may argue that this is less of a risk to Northern Ireland given that we have the protocol and will have an ongoing relationship with the EU. However, the more distant the relationship between GB and the EU, then the greater the requirement for checks and barriers down the Irish Sea. Checks cannot be avoided entirely under the protocol. The protocol is the sad and inevitable outworking of the decision of the UK government to seek a hard Brexit. But we do need a UK-EU deal to mitigate, mitigate the scale of the impact. And, and any downturn or hit to the economy in GB would have a severe impact on us in Northern Ireland. There is a suspicion that the UK government is determined to proceed with the current time scale and end the implementation period in order to mask the economic damage of a Brexit, even a no-trade deal Brexit in the wider recession and economic turbulence arising from the COVID-19 pandemic. 
And just to be very clear, it's already out there in the press. Alliance, along with SDLP, asked for an extension at executive. What was voted upon, what was voted upon was a proposal to come back to this in two weeks' time. If the executive can come back in two weeks' time, then surely this country and the people who work here and the businesses that are currently in financial crisis need time. Or do people think that COVID-19 doesn't exist? Do they think that the redundancies that are coming up, they think that people who have had to move on to universal credit because we are in such social crisis at the moment doesn't exist? How can we keep piling on the problems? It is time now to look at the negotiations. EU has said it's prepared to open a longer period of time, and I say thank you to the EU for that, because I don't know about the rest of you, but how much more do you want our businesses to be put under pressure? How, men, how much more stress, how much more mental health problems are you prepared to put on owners of businesses here? It's time to catch yourselves on. We need extra time and we need the government over in Westminster to recognise the fact that this will have a detrimental impact here. We are in a health crisis and we're looking forward to an economic crisis because of this. Member's time is up. Thank you. I just want to make a, a general point of order. It is accepted convention that meetings of the Northern Ireland Executive and what goes on at them are private. Now, individual government ministers may choose not to accept that, but on the floor of the Assembly that will be accepted. It's not appropriate for members to reveal the details of private executive meetings. I don't think that that, I think that's, just, I'll just, I, no, I don't want you to comment. I just want to park that there. Yes, it may be in the press. What I'm telling you is ministers may choose not to abide by the convention that executive meetings are private, but that convention will be observed on the floor of this House. Mr. Jim Allister. Make no mistake, this motion is not about delaying Brexit, it's about killing Brexit. It's not about getting a more opportune time for Brexit, it's about cancelling Brexit. Uh, and to do such a thing, to delay Brexit at this time, would be economically catastrophic. Because for a nation like ourselves, who are coming out of the incredible damage to our economy over COVID, we would then be hit for the next two years with billions upon billions of financial demands into Brussels with no say over how one percent of it is spent. And on top of that, we would lose the flexibility, the agility that our nation will need to plot a way forward economically and would be tied into the block which is the most ill-suited to find novel ways of dealing with an economic crisis. Because the EU is so overburdened with its own bureaucracy, it is so stilted, it is so rule-bound that it is the worst equipped to ever show any agility coming out of an economic crisis. And the United Kingdom then would subject itself to that uh, uh, situation over which it would have no control. Whereas what we need as the United Kingdom is an opportunity to show agility and to deal with the economy in novel ways which the EU's regulations would never entertain. So I can think of no worse time to delay Brexit than this. But of course there is a way to avoid the need to extend, and that's to get a deal. And if the EU wants to avoid a crash out by its paymaster, then the way to do it is to reach a deal. And they should do it mindful that they stand with more to lose than we in the United Kingdom do. So if they want a deal, if they want to avoid a cliff edge, then get down to business. This really should be make-up time for the EU. And instead of that, of course, they are persisting with trying to pillage our fishing industry, with trying to bind us 
to what they call level playing field commitments, which will tie our hands behind our backs economically, which will shape and restrict the type of trade deals we can do. Well, if they want a deal, they can have a deal, but it has to be on fair terms. Now, of course, the principle of Brexit remains absolutely sound and necessary. Sadly, it has been largely emasculated for us in Northern Ireland through the iniquitous protocol, but the principle of Brexit remains sound. I greatly regret, I have to say, the slippage I'm detecting from the DUP on the issue of the protocol. This all, of course, started with the foolhardy letter that Mr O'Toole referenced in August 2016, when the First Minister and the then Deputy First Minister laid the groundwork for special status and for ultimately this protocol. And now we've reached a situation where the protocol can only be implemented with the acquiescence and the active involvement of the executive. Well, that presents those unionist parties in that executive with an opportunity to thwart that. Mr. Putz told us, told me an answer to question. He would be providing no infrastructure or, or reports. And yet last week, backpedalling, soft peddling, talking indeed the lingo of Remainers about there being opportunity both ways. It does sadden me that instead of standing firm and recognising the ability to thwart the protocol, that there now is a spirit abroad, it seems, to acquiesce in it. I don't think that's serving Northern Ireland's interests well. Uh, and so I say this is not the time to stop Brexit. This is the time to proceed with Brexit. To stop it would be fatal economically for the whole United Kingdom. Thank you. All members have spoken. I now call on Rachel Woods to wind on her amendment. Ms Woods. Thank you, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the members for all their contributions to the debate today. So I'll now try and summarise the main points made as best as I can while making some remarks. Mr Storey claimed that the motion and amendment is an attempt to stop Brexit. This is a complete misrepresentation. As I've said, the NI protocol is coming into effect in January next year, and the motion and our amendment is about addressing the fact that Northern Ireland is reeling from a global health crisis and is not adequately prepared. Ms Anderson took an alternative view, speaking in favour of the motion and the amendment, and she noted that a majority in the Assembly and a majority of people in Northern Ireland do not support Brexit. She discussed the protocol as an ugly compromise and supported the request of an extension, noting that the impact on the community and voluntary sector and the funding shortfall that leaving the EU will bring. Dr Aiken questions why we are having this debate today and highlighted the critical phase of negotiations, as well as the need for a plan, including costs of goods coming into Northern Ireland. Our view is that action must be taken now, and the voice of this Assembly must be heard before the deadline for extending the transition process passes. He also raised the issue of a lack of debate and scrutiny of all the issues around the Northern Ireland Protocol and Brexit. We would, of course, welcome this and more detail from the executive given to every member of this House. John Blair noted that the significance of decisions that need to be taken, that they should not be rushed and the extension is, is needed to stop the disruption from new arrangements on fishing rights and other infrastructural issues. He also spoke about the need to avoid future immigration systems that will be hugely damaging for Northern Ireland, and we totally support this sentiment. Paul Frew outlined his support for Europe, but questioned the motive of this motion. What I would say is look at the evidence, look at the forecasts, an extension is needed to limit the damage to Northern Ireland. Mr McGuigan noted how such an extension is just plain common sense. He also outlined his concern over environmental protections for Northern Ireland, of which there should be no, no regression, and we would completely agree with this too. I would also like to point out that the action from the Minister for Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs, who has failed to bring forward any plans for an independent environmental protection agency that this Assembly called for earlier this year, the onus is on the Minister and his department to ensure there is no regression in protections. Sinead McLaughlin outlined the reasons of why we need more time, that the unforeseen crisis and workings around the protocol necessitates an extension, and we would agree, something, with other, member, something other members have chosen to ignore and appeal for unity. Mr McAleer raised his concerns over Brexit and the agri-food sector. 
on top of the COVID pandemic, highlighting its vulnerabilities alongside the implementation of the protocol. Mike Nesbitt then rose sharing the concern of Dr Aiken over the timing of the debate today. Whilst, we, whilst he accepts that we are the most affected and least prepared, so how can the party not support a call for more time to get ready? Kelly Armstrong reiterated that this was not a leave versus remain matter, which we agree with. But given our situation, the timetabling for this year, it's difficult for everyone, including businesses. Jim Allister then claimed that his, this motion was again about cancelling Brexit, which again is a complete misrepresentation. It says nothing in the motion or amendment about preventing Brexit. And unfortunately, he chooses, like others, to simply ignore the extreme circumstances that we face. Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, many aspects of our lives have been effectively put on hold by the global health crisis. Holidays have been cancelled or rescheduled, family get-togethers put off, birthdays celebrated alone, for example. Indeed, if we're delaying elections in some parts of the UK, we, we are acknowledging that we need to work to protect the public first and foremost, rather than stick to political timetables from before COVID, and Brexit is absolutely no exception. If the firm Get Brexit Done timeline has been stuck to by the Tories and others, it is so at the detriment of the people, the environment, the community, the businesses, wider society and the economy of Northern Ireland. What we need is some time to actually prepare rather than shooting ourselves in the foot once more. Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, the point is still for us. Why, when our people are trying to recover from one crisis, would we deliberately hit them with another in the form of a no-deal Brexit or arrangements that destroy livelihoods and damage our communities here? Thank you. Thank you. I call on Mr Colin McGrath to conclude and wind up the debate on the substantive motion. Mr McGrath. Mr Principal, Deputy Speaker, and I suppose I have the easy task of trying to mop up all the views of this debate. And I want to thank uh, you for letting us have the debate and also to the members for their contribution. Um, and I do appreciate that the debate does, uh, the motion does call on the UK Government uh, to act, but the fact that no Minister from the Executive Office felt that they could attend to respond or offer their thoughts does make me wonder if they are focusing more on out of sight, out of mind. In other words, if they pretend that they don't have their divisions on Brexit, then they may not exist. Um, and in terms of this place too, the vote to exit the EU was in June 2016, it's nearly four years ago. Article 50 was triggered in March 2017, just over three years ago. And in the past number of years, we've had protocols, withdrawal agreements, the pantomime in Westminster, and eventually Boris and his majority waiting through uh, the, the, the Brexit that the people of the North didn't vote for. And yet today, today, four years later, we are having our first substantive debate on the matter. And it's not from the leads of our executive, but it is from ourselves and the SDLP. The amount of confusion and concern that there is out there in communities and businesses is palpable. People aren't just scared of the pandemic and of coronavirus. Businesses and other community groups are fearful of the impact of Brexit. They have heard much about how funding might dry up, how new trade conditions and regulations will add days to their processes and astronomical costs to their businesses. There is a real fear that many of the businesses will not survive. As I have said, coronavirus and its impact could not have been predicted. And while people have begun to move a little, businesses haven't. They have slowed up, and for many of them, they haven't even opened up at all. If there was ever a need to stop, to gather, to take a breath and see where we are in terms of our economy, it is now. The SDLP has always been and will always be proudly a pro-European party. And we are not here today to rerun the referendum debate. It is a debate that the people of Northern Ireland have had their say on, although it would be remiss of me not to suggest that we may be in a better place politically if we, more public representatives give weight to the Council of the people here than the positions of voters elsewhere. Our proposals for an extension to the transition period is not motivated by politically partisan approach. It is designed to seek a consensus in a polarised atmosphere. In the tradition of Hume, I see institutions which respected the difference and diversity of a continent emerging from conflict and sought to bring warring people together in a spirit of common purpose and endeavour. But I accept that mine is not the only outlook that I have listened for years to the points made by other people. Whether you are a member of Boris's Brexiteer Ultras or an ode to joy loving Remainer, the issue at the heart of today's debate is whether your political objective it cannot be reasonably achieved in the four weeks that is left 
before the opportunity to extend the transition period is lost. We already had significant concerns about the impact of Brexit on our economy. It is impossible to argue that the crisis we currently face is immaterial to those concerns or will in some way be neutral. Renegotiating our relationship with our largest external trade partner at a time when we are about to enter a significant recession on the back of the most significant public health crisis in living memory is not ambitious. It is not something that can be fuelled by the spirit of Dunkirk. It is dangerously irresponsible and it will cost the livelihoods of thousands. This, yes, of course. Would the member not consider that the path to avoiding an extension to the transition is getting a deal? And therefore, in that regard, has he any criticism to offer? Bearing in mind he represents a coastal constituency, has he any criticism to offer for the intransigence of the EU? in seeking to rape and pillage our fishing waters. Is there any criticism to make of that, at least in the name of his fishermen? I thank the member for his intervention, and I will, of course, be mentioning fishermen later in my debate. But I think that uh, all indications are that there is no deal, that the deal is not likely to occur. And the opportunity that we have is here and now as an assembly to ask for that extension, and that is what we want to put on the record. Because this assembly holds the unique position of being a named party to the withdrawal agreement. We have a responsibility above and beyond that of other devolved administrations it is imperative that we exercise our role and the power of our voice to compel London to act in the interests of those that we represent. Now, I would like to take a few minutes just to discuss some of the contributions that members have made. Uh, Rachel Woods, in her amendment, which we will be supporting, uh, mentioned the significant impact of coronavirus on the capacity to deliver Brexit. And that was a key point that was actually articulated last week in evidence to the TEO committee by the lead official uh, here from our executive, Andrew McCormick, who agreed that the department is in all likelihood wasn't as ready as it could be because of the impact of Brexit. The officials have been working on other priorities, not Brexit. And if they are not working on the preparations for Brexit, then we may not be ready. She also raised the significant question that businesses will have to face. Uh, we can highlight here that there are many, many unanswered questions. So, you know, what, an extension will give us the space and the opportunity to address those concerns, to address those questions. In his contribution, Mr Storey mentioned that he will stop at nothing. I'm just going to take that sentence and say, do you know what? We won't stop at nothing because we'll stop at nothing to help our businesses that will struggle. We will stop at nothing to help our food supply that will suffer. We will stop at nothing to help our communities that are going to suffer as well. But it is not for partisan reasons that he stated. It is simply because we want to protect those businesses, we want to protect those food supplies, and we want to protect those communities. He also highlighted the costs of the EU, and yet Northern Ireland is a net beneficiary of it. The people that we represent in this room get more out of being a member of the EU than we give in. And yet people say that they want to exit to save money. I'm sure the Little Englanders will be delighted with your contributions, but we represent the people of the North. And Martina Anderson uh, mentioned about how Brexit is causing a reconsideration of people's views on a united Ireland. And that's a point that does indeed frighten and scare many of the people opposite, because if it does lead to a referendum, I wonder how often we'll hear then about the democratic will of people and the mandate that is offered. And she also highlighted, like others, that Wales is calling for this extension, Scotland is calling for this extension, Europe is calling for this extension, and I think that it would be good to see that the majority of the people here will probably call for that extension as well. And Mr Aiken has highlighted how there were many uh, unanswered questions that remain regarding Brexit. And with only a few weeks, it's one of the strongest arguments I've heard of asking for an extension. If there's a plethora of unanswered questions, then let's take time to get the answers. Let's not go into the unknown. 
And then uh, we had a contribution from Mr Blair that focused uh, on the imposition that Brexit will have on the ability for trade to occur uh, freely at the moment and how there is a lack of clarity there and also referred to the fishing communities and the uncertainty that they will face as well. And obviously being from South Down, I absolutely get that point with the fishing communities that are there. Uh, Mr Frew discussed the process and the theory behind Brexit, but you've missed the point. We're not here to rerun the debate about EU membership. We're here to say, can we have the extension that allows us to be able to give our businesses and our communities the best opportunity to thrive? And that can't happen if we're going into the unknown. For businesses, we need to go into the known. Gift, go ahead. By talking about the fact we're not beneficiaries. Sorry, I didn't hear you. <laughs> Can you no, again? It. Sorry, I, did, I wasn't able to hear you from over here. My apologies. But I am coming on to the contributions that you made, so I can uh, say to you that you also detailed how many of the questions remain unanswered and how, in fact, officials are contributing to the negotiations and not ministers, and how that it needs to be the ministers. And I think that in order to do that, we need to be able to take an extension to give us the extra time to allow our ministers to go in and to be able uh, to make the contributions that they do. Yes, sure. Thank you to my colleague for giving way. Would he agree with me that the Ulster Unionist Party were actually extremely persuasive in describing how difficult it will be for this Assembly to scrutinise what is happening in relation to the protocol and for us to implement the requirements in the protocol? Does he also does he agree with me that it's incompatible to, say, to talk about the immense difficulty we face in the coming months and then say it's not the, now is not the time to ask for an extension? Um, I absolutely, I completely agree. I think both contributions were eloquent on behalf of the uh, motion that we have presented today. <laughs> the uh, member will not give way because he's got seven seconds so, left. I believe that we must stand with our brothers and sisters in Scotland and Wales, all of us Leaver and Remainers, and counsel a response which maximises the chances of agreement and defends the interest of those that we represent. We support this motion and the amendment. Thank you. Point of order, Mr Wells. I'm raising it at this stage, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, because the next subject we're debating is extremely serious. You exercise enormous power in this building, Principal Deputy Speaker. Can you explain why, given the fact that this is the highest temperature recorded in June in Northern Ireland for 40 years, the heat is on in this building at the moment? It's a, there's going to be, we're about to enter a heated debate. It's going to be a long night. Why, oh why, are the radiators in this building on on the hottest day of the year? Uh, well, I think, strictly speaking, I, I think that's a matter for the Commission, although I suspect it may be some civil service scheme to grow tomatoes around the place as a renewable food source or something, because it is warm enough you could grow tomatoes in this building. The question, therefore, uh, members, is that the amendment standing in the names of Rachel Woods and Claire Bailey be made. As many as are of that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary, if any? No. Aye. Clear the lobbies. The question will be put in three minutes. I would remind you that we should continue to uphold social distancing and that members who have proxy voting arrangements in place should not come to the chamber. The House will divide. Order. Order. Members, resume their seats, please. Members will resume their seats. Before I put the question, I would again remind those members present that, if possible, it would be preferable if we could avoid a division. Fat chance. The question is that the amendment standing in the names of Rachel Woods and Claire Bailey be agreed. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, if any. No. Do we have tellers? Order. Tellers have been appointed as follows. The tellers for the ayes are Matthew O'Toole and Sinead McLaughlin. The tellers for the noes are Steve Aiken and Jonathan Buckley. Before the Assembly divides, I want to remind you that as per Standing Order 112, the Assembly currently has proxy voting arrangements in place. Members who have authorised another member to vote on their behalf are not entitled to vote in person and should not enter the lobbies. It is important 
that during any division, social distancing in the chamber continues to be observed. In order to facilitate this, I would ask the following. Any members in the chamber who are not due to vote in person should consider leaving the chamber until this division has concluded. Those members who wish to vote in the lobbies on the opposite side of the chamber to which they are sitting should leave the chamber via the nearest door and enter the relevant lobby via the rotunda. Those remaining members who are sitting closest to the lobby doors should enter the lobbies first. Any member who has voted may then wish to leave the chamber until this division has concluded. However, any member who needs to vote in both lobbies should not leave the chamber. I remind members of the need to be patient at all times and to follow the instructions of the lobby clerks and to respect the need for social distancing. Clear the lobbies. The Assembly will divide. Eyes to my right, nose to my left. Order. Members resume their seats, please. I ask the clerk to read the result. 88 members voted, 50 members voted aye, 38 members voted no. The amendment is agreed. The amendment uh, is made. The question now is that the motion as amended be agreed. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Contrary, no. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Members can take their ease for a few moments while there's a change at the top table. Thank you.